we're going to discuss quadratic irrational numbers and what they have to do with continued fractions. So let's go over our goals and some definitions. An irrational number x is called a quadratic irrational number if it's irrational and it's the root of a degree 2 polynomial, aka a quadratic, with integer coefficients. In other words, if ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0 for integers a, b, and c, but x doesn't happen to be a rational number. This rules out, for example, any choice of a equals 0. If you have a quadratic in air quotes and a is equal to 0, it was actually linear and the root is a rational number when b and c are integers. However, there are other choices of a, b, and c where a isn't 0, but the solutions happen to be rational numbers. Now, somewhat unrelated at first, an irrational number is said to have purely periodic continued fraction expansion if there is a k, a sort of shift, so that a sub i plus k is equal to a sub i for all i. So the partial quotients, if you move k terms down the list, begin to repeat themselves. And x is said to be eventually periodic in its continued fraction expansion if there is a k, same as above, but now we introduce an n so that you have this periodicity, ai plus k equals ai, but only past a certain point. That's what, that's what n takes care of. You still have a repetition of partial quotients in block sizes of k, but you throw out, or don't consider, I should say, the first n partial quotients. So purely periodic, you have to have the pattern that repeats itself straight away. Eventually periodic means there is a pattern that repeats, but it only starts after a certain point, and that's what capital N accounts for. Now our goal is to prove two theorems. The first due to Euler, if x is irrational with eventually periodic continued fraction expansion, then it is a quadratic irrational number, providing a link between these two notions. If a number has eventually periodic continued fraction expansion, then it is the root of a quadratic polynomial with integer coefficients. And then Lagrange sometime later proved a converse. If x is quadratic irrational, then the continued fraction expansion is eventually periodic. So we're going to prove both of these things. The first is significantly easier than the second, and we'll close the video with some remarks on non-quadratic but otherwise algebraic irrational numbers x. They're going to be very brief remarks. Okay, the first step in Euler's theorem, that if a number has eventually periodic continued fraction expansion, it is a quadratic irrational, this is pretty straightforward. So first we'll consider the case of purely periodic continued fractions. So let's suppose x is irrational and has purely periodic continued fraction expansion. We're going to prove it is a quadratic irrational. Well, the continued fraction looks like this. We have a0 through a k minus 1, but a sub k is equal to a0. We begin repeating the same pattern, and then a k plus 1 is equal to a1, and so forth. So whatever a0 through a k minus 1 are, that is the block of partial quotients that then repeats itself. In other words, if we build the continued fraction expansion like this, once we hit index k, we just start repeating. So notice that a0 plus 1 over etc, 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 so right here, a0 plus etc, that's exactly what x is. And since we know that convergence really implies a lot of strong arithmetic properties, we can do this substitution. So x is equal to a0 plus 1 over a1, but once you get down to index k, we're going to use this real number term rather than an integer and say there's our remainder x. So if we have a purely periodic continued fraction expansion, then x can be written like this. But observe, that means that x on the left is equal to this partial quotient, which is a remainder term, it's not an integer, but it still works out, we've shown this in the past, this times pk minus 1 plus pk minus 2 over this times qk minus 1 plus qk minus 2. Now where pk minus 1, pk minus 2, qk minus 1, qk minus 2, these are all integers because they were computed using a0 through a k minus 1 only and those are integer partial quotients. So what do we have here? We have x on the left and we have this ratio of x times an integer plus another integer over x times an integer plus another integer. Well if we simply cross multiply and move some terms around notice we now have a quadratic with integer coefficients. Therefore since x is irrational because it has a continued fraction expansion that goes on forever and it is the root of a quadratic polynomial with integer coefficients, it is a quadratic irrational. So if we have a number whose continued fraction expansion is purely periodic, then it is a quadratic irrational. At this point, we're more or less equipped to complete the proof of Euler's theorem that a number whose continued fraction expansion is eventually periodic is a quadratic irrational, but it will be convenient to prove the following. 
A real number x is a quadratic irrational if and only if there are integers l, m, and n. m and n are positive and m is not a perfect square, so that x is equal to l either plus or minus the square root of m over n. In other words, quadratic irrationals can be written in a very particular way. Well, suppose x happens to be of this form, l plus or minus root m over n. It doesn't take a lot of work to do some algebra and prove that n squared x minus 2nlx minus m equals 0, and therefore x is a quadratic irrational number. And since m is not a perfect square, it does ensure, by the way, that x is irrational. Conversely, suppose ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0 and x is irrational. In other words, it is a quadratic irrational number. Well, just the quadratic formula tells us that x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, and this allows you to just pick l is equal to negative b, m is equal to b squared minus 4ac, and n is equal to 2a. And since the number is irrational, m, b squared minus 4ac, is not a perfect square. Okay, now we can prove Euler's theorem. Suppose x has eventually periodic continued fraction expansion. We will derive that it must be a quadratic irrational number. So here is our eventually periodic continued fraction expansion. The partial quotients a sub i are the bit that don't repeat themselves, but once we hit the block that begins to repeat itself, I've indexed them using b. So we have a naught through a n, and then b naught through bk, which repeats b naught through bk, and so forth. So let's let y be a number given just by that purely periodic expansion using the bit that repeats itself in x. We know that a purely periodic continued fraction represents a quadratic irrational number. Also, x can be written as a0 through a n here in its continued fraction expansion, followed by y. So, x is equal to y times pn plus pn minus 1 over y times qn plus qn minus 1, and y is a quadratic irrational number. So our eventually periodic continued fraction, x, has to be able to be expressed in the following way, where y is a quadratic irrational and pn, pn minus 1, qn, and qn minus 1 are all integers. But y being a quadratic irrational means it takes this form we've already discussed, so we can go ahead and plug that in, multiply numerator and denominator by n, and then collect our root m term in both numerator and denominator. Now what we're going to do is multiply by the algebraic conjugate of the denominator so that our denominator will become an integer. And here's what you'll end up with. Okay, so the algebraic conjugate of something plus or minus number times root something is this thing minus plus. You simply reverse whatever the sign is here. So I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by that. Your denominator turns into just this squared minus this squared. Observe that our root m squared just becomes m. And when you multiply through, you end up with various integers and various things times root m. So I've gone ahead and done the algebra. It's not particularly important what these numbers are, just to recognize that we are going to end up with something plus or minus number times root m over integer. So we found that if x has eventually periodic continued fraction expansion, it can be written in the following way here. So all we have to do is let l prime be whatever this huge integer is, plus or minus. We wanted root of something, so I'm going to take this whole monstrosity and move it under the radical by squaring it. And then this denominator I'm going to call n prime. In other words, x is now l prime plus or minus root m prime over n prime. And x is therefore a quadratic irrational number. We know, by the way, that m prime is not a perfect square because otherwise x would be rational and x has an infinite continued fraction expansion. So we already knew x was irrational. What we've established is that it is a quadratic irrational. We've established, therefore, that if a number has eventually periodic continued fraction expansion, it is a quadratic irrational. Lagrange's theorem goes the other way. We're going to assume that x is a quadratic irrational, and we want to show that its continued fraction expansion is eventually periodic. Let's just try doing it in the most straightforward way possible. Start with a quadratic irrational and start computing its continued fraction. So we're going to represent x in the way we know we can represent a quadratic irrational h is an integer, j is a positive integer, n is a positive integer, which is not a perfect square. Let's just denote a to be the integer part of whatever this is. We know that computing the continued fraction expansion will now involve computing 1 over x minus its integer part a. 
So with x of our specific form and a some positive integer, we need to compute 1 over x minus a. Well, here's x minus a. Multiply numerator and denominator by j. Great. Now we're going to multiply by the algebraic conjugate of the denominator. I have something plus or minus root n, so its algebraic conjugate is that thing minus plus. This symbol just means reverse whichever one you had here. Once you distribute everything out and collect, we end up with j factored out of the entire numerator and then n minus the quantity h minus aj squared. Now, if j could be factored out of that denominator, that would be really great. If I could cancel this j out of the denominator, the only radical left is root n, which is exactly the radical we started with. So if we can establish that j can be factored out of the denominator, when you move from one term to the next in your continued fraction computation, whatever your value of the remainder, x1, x2, x3, etc., are, the number under the radical will not change. And that will be a great simplification of trying to keep track of things. So now let's establish that given any integer k you could possibly want, any quadratic or rational x can be written in the form that we actually want, where j, the denominator, is a factor of the thing under the radical minus, note that h is the number up here in the numerator that isn't under the radical, minus your arbitrary integer k, and here's j, our denominator, that quantity squared. We just want to show that no matter what quadratic or rational you have, possibly by changing the numbers, involved, you can have the same x, but now represent it in form h plus root n over j, where j is indeed a factor of that quantity there. So we already know we can write an arbitrary quadratic irrational in the form a plus or minus root n over b, where a is an integer, b and n are positive integers, and n is not a perfect square. So the difference is, by the way, is we don't know that this would hold. We don't know that the denominator is a factor of this little n minus uh, this minus an arbitrary k times b all squared. And also, we want to just have a plus up here. That's just a simplification we're going to try to introduce. So whatever x is, a plus or minus root n over b, we're going to multiply the numerator and denominator by plus or minus b. How do I choose whether I'm multiplying by plus b or minus b based on this sign here? If this was plus root n, multiply by b over b. If this was minus root n, multiply by minus b over minus b. So we're multiplying by plus or minus b over plus or minus b, where it's the same plus or minus as in the numerator. So we end up with plus or minus b a. Now observe, if you take this plus or minus and multiply it by another plus or minus, where it's the same, you either get plus plus or minus minus. Either way, this becomes a plus. The b I'm bringing underneath the radical as b squared. And then our denominator becomes plus or minus b squared. But now we can observe this holds. This j is the denominator, plus or minus b squared, but when factoring is involved, you don't really care about plus or minus, so just b squared. Is that a factor of the thing under the radical, b squared little n, minus the integer not under the radical in the numerator, that's plus or minus b a, minus arbitrary k times the denominator. Now our denominator is plus or minus b squared, so when you minus that, you get minus plus, it just reverses it but then all of that gets squared. So observe that this here has a b that can be factored out of it, but it's squared. So this has a b squared that I can factor out. This has a b squared that I can factor out. Overall, b squared is indeed a factor. So possibly by multiplying by the denominator over the denominator, our standard form of quadratic irrationals can now be rewritten in a form where this fact holds true regardless. So we're going to proceed now with a proof of Lagrange's theorem with the new generic assumption. Whenever we have a quadratic irrational x, we're writing it in this form so that the denominator j is a factor of this enormous expression. Also, the radical in the numerator is being added. Observe now we may have made the denominator negative. This is a non-standard representation of our quadratic irrational number, but it's still a way to do it, and we're going to use this form. So whatever quadratic irrational number x we start with, we're now going to write it as x0 because we are going to be keeping track of indices. We're going to be running our continued fraction algorithm. And we're going to call it something plus root n over something else where we are allowed to assume that that denominator j0 can be factored out of that master expression here. We showed it could be written this way for an arbitrary integer, and we're picking specifically the integer part of the number we started with. So based on our earlier computation, 
we computed what happens when you do 1 over x minus a. And we got this whole thing here. It's just now we're keeping track of indices. We had hoped that you could factor this denominator little j <clears throat> out of this denominator, and we now know we can. We wrote it in that form to begin with. And when you cancel the j naught out of this denominator, you end up with capital J, which tells us we should define some recursive sequences. Here we have our standard continued fraction algorithm. Okay, so the ANs are going to spit out the partial quotients of X. But now our next denominator is exactly this expression based on our previous terms divided by the previous denominator. And we know we can make that quotient happen. It will be an integer. And our next numerator term right here is just the previous A times the previous J minus the previous H. So 1 over xn minus an is going to be xn plus 1. That's how xn plus 1 was defined. But now xn plus 1 is just hn plus 1 plus root n over jn plus 1. So we have a nice way of representing the next remainder in our continued fraction computation. So under this generic assumption that our quadratic irrational has been written in a particular form, namely that the denominator is a factor of that expression there, where a0 is the integer part of x0, and we establish that we can in general write a uh, quadratic irrational in this form, we define some sequences. Now let's prove some stuff. The continued fraction of x is exactly given by the sequence of ans, as we've already remarked. We're running the continued fraction algorithm, okay? To compute xn plus 1 and then generate an plus 1 out of it, formally here we simply have it as this expression, but we've already shown that this is exactly 1 over xn minus an, which is the continued fraction algorithm. So we are generating our partial quotients, so yes, the continued fraction expansion of x is given by the sequence of a's that this algorithm generates. Furthermore, suppose you have a pair of h's and j's that equal each other. So this h equals this h and this j equals that j. So whatever index you pick here and whatever index you pick here as a pair, h comma j equals h comma j. If that ever happens for two different indices, then the continued fraction expansion is eventually periodic. Well, why is that? Let's just assume that k was the larger index. These are two different indices. Let's just assume k is the bigger one. So let's call it j plus something, which I'm calling l. So xi, equals xk. Why is that? Because x subscript is equal to h subscript plus root n over j subscript. This is not changing. It only depends on the choice of h and j. So if this choice of h and j is the same as this one, then xi equals xk. But k is equal to j plus l. So if I run l steps in the continued fraction algorithm, I end up at exactly the value I was at before which means it's going to start repeating itself. I'm going to start getting the same A's, the same H's, the same J's, and since one choice of HJ got me to itself, it's going to get me to itself again and again and again and again. It's going to start repeating itself. So since the algorithm produces the partial quotients as well, the A's, those are also going to repeat themselves. Once we hit a certain pair of HJ that repeats itself, the partial quotients are also going to be repeating themselves. So with x taking this generic form that we know it can and defining these sequences recursively as we've established, the first thing we're going to show is rather remarkable. The jn's, the denominators as we move through one remainder to the next, can only take finitely many different values. Offhand, there's no reason to believe this to be true. We have recursively defined sequences that involve squaring and multiplication, and we're saying jn does not get too big. There are only finitely many different values that it can possibly take. Well, we know that the continued fraction expansion of x has this property that if you terminate it at the nth partial quotient and then put the remainder as the next term, you'll get back exactly x. That's way back when, when we were first doing continued fraction representations. So this right here is xn plus 1 pn plus pn minus 1 over xn plus 1 qn plus qn minus 1. So x is equal to that expression there. We also know that every xn is a quadratic irrational which can be written with the same plus root n in the numerator. Great, okay? that's how we're defining the sequence of remainders xn plus 1. So x can be written like this, but if we solve this for xn plus 1, okay, solving this expression for xn plus 1 just takes a little bit of algebra. You'll end up with this right here. Factoring qn minus 1 over qn out looks like kind of counterproductive. This looks worse, but observe if you distribute the qn plus 1 in, you'll end up with exactly this numerator. If you distribute the qn in, you'll end up with exactly this denominator. 
So we've written xn plus 1 in this particular form, but why? Now let's take an algebraic conjugate of both sides. Now algebraic conjugates are really quite nice. Uh, the conjugation operation distributes across the sums and differences, products, and quotients, which means on the left, we're just going to get the conjugate of xn plus 1. This is a rational number. Its algebraic conjugate is itself. Same thing here, same thing here. The only place the algebraic conjugate will do anything is on these x's on the right-hand side. Now observe, x was h0 plus root n over j0, which is not a rational number. Okay, Capital N is not a perfect square. We assumed it was an irrational number to begin with, which means that its algebraic conjugate, h0 minus root n over j0, is not the same number. Okay, this is a different number. x bar and x are different. So the algebraic conjugate of the n plus first remainder takes this form. Now as x is a quadratic irrational, x and x bar are different, but as the index n runs to infinity, we know that this ratio and this ratio are both going to tend to x. So move the qn and qn minus 1 over to the left and take a limit as n goes to infinity. So on the right, this goes to x, this goes to x, x minus x bar over x bar minus x, observe the numerator and denominator are just opposites of one another, so that's just minus 1. So this limit doesn't just exist, it is equal to minus 1. Now the qn's and the qn minus 1's are positive integers, and indeed qn is larger than qn minus 1 once you move past the second index. What's more important is that qn over qn minus 1 is positive, because they're both positive integers. So for that limit to be negative, the algebraic conjugate xn plus 1 must be a negative number for sufficiently large n. It doesn't have to be true for every term, because the limit is minus 1. Eventually the terms have to be negative. So for sufficiently large index, the algebraic conjugate of xn plus 1 must be negative. So we've shown that the algebraic conjugate of the n plus first remainder is eventually negative. But xn plus 1 is larger than 1, and our continued fraction algorithm, our remainders, xn plus 1 are always bigger than 1, and then we take the integer part and we do 1 over that, etc. So xn plus 1s are always bigger than 1. So what happens when I take the difference xn plus 1 minus its algebraic conjugate? Now this is bigger than 1, this is negative, and I'm subtracting it. So overall, this will be bigger than 1. But now we can do the arithmetic here, and this simplifies. This hn plus 1 minus this one cancels. This plus root n minus minus root n becomes 2 root n. So 2 root n over jn plus 1 is bigger than 1 for sufficiently large n past a certain index. Now n is positive. So what we conclude is that we have positive number over jn plus 1 must be positive. So for sufficiently large index, those j's are positive. But this also tells us, since this ratio is bigger than 1, it's not just positive, the denominator cannot be bigger than the numerator, otherwise this couldn't be larger than 1. So the j's, the denominators, for sufficiently large index are positive but less than 2 root n. So, Past that index, there are only finitely many choices for j, a positive number, but not larger than 2 root n. Before that index, there's only finitely many terms to begin with. So past a certain index, there's only finitely many values I can take, and before that index, that's only finitely many terms anyway. Overall, there are only finitely many values that the j's can possibly take. So what can we prove next? We just proved that the j's only take finitely many values. Well, the sequence of h's is bounded above, specifically for sufficiently large index n. In other words, past a certain point, they're all less than root n. So except possibly for x0, every xn was the reciprocal of a remainder term. xn plus 1 was 1 over xn minus an. And as we've already remarked, because xn is bigger than an but less than an plus 1, xn minus an is between 0 and 1. So we're taking 1 over something between 0 and 1, we're ending up with something positive, but bigger than 1. xn plus 1 is bigger than 1, except possibly for x0. So, on the one hand, jn plus 1 was simply de defined in this way. Observe that this quantity here is exactly negative hn plus 1, but once you square it, that doesn't matter. So jn plus 1, on the one hand, is n minus hn plus 1 squared over jn. However, over here, you can solve this for jn plus 1, it's just this numerator divided by xn plus 1. 
So setting those two things equal to each other, <clears throat> we can solve for xn plus 1 and get that xn plus 1 is jn over the square root of n minus hn plus 1. So what we did is we set this equal to this and we solve for xn plus 1 observing that this is actually factorable as a difference of two squares root n minus hn plus 1 root n plus hn plus 1 and then those two things are going to cancel there. So xn plus 1 is actually jn over root n minus hn plus 1. The jn's are eventually positive we proved that and xn plus 1 is certainly positive, except possibly for x0, all of the xn's are positive, which means that the denominator has to be positive, which tells me that hn plus 1 must be less than root n. So we've just shown that the h's, past a certain index at least, are less than root n, but much more is true. There's only finitely many values that the h's can take. So looking at how hn plus 1 is defined, if you just move the hn over, you end up with this right here, but an times jn, well, an is a partial quotient. It's at least as big as 1, so this is bigger than or equal to jn. For sufficiently large n's, the j's are positive, so hn plus 1 plus hn must be positive. However, we also know that both of these terms must be less than root n. So I have two numbers whose sum is positive, but each of them is less than root n. That tells you that they also cannot be less than minus root n, because if they were, you would have to add more than root n to get a positive number out of it, and you can't. Okay, The amount you add can't be bigger than root n, but we know that when you add them together, you get a positive number. So the other term, if it is negative, has to be bigger than minus root n. So for sufficiently large index, hn is between plus or minus root n. That only accounts for finitely many integers, and hn has to be an integer. So past a certain index, at least, there's only finitely many possible values for the h's, and we only ignored up to a certain point, meaning we only ignored finitely many hn's. So past a certain point, only finitely many possibilities, but before that point, that's a finite list, altogether finitely many possible values for hn. Which means we can now prove Lagrange's theorem that a quadratic irrational number must have an eventually periodic continued fraction expansion. So the sequence of hn's and jn's each can only take finitely many values, which means there's only finitely many possible pairs of values between them. But there's infinitely many pairs and only finitely many possible values, which means eventually a pair has to repeat itself. This is a classic pigeonholing argument. But we've already shown that if you ever get a pair hijji that repeats itself as another pair hkjk, that the continued fraction expansion is eventually periodic. Therefore, Quadratic irrational numbers have eventually periodic continued fraction expansions. Now let's take a look at the algorithm we employed there in a practical example. Okay, So for an irrational number, we computed partial quotients like this normally. This is how we typically do it. But computationally, this involves dividing 1 by a real number, and that's very computationally intensive, and it's prone to error terms getting magnified very much. So on an intuitive level, suppose xn minus an is pretty small, but you're off by a little bit, but a little bit for a small number is proportionally kind of a lot. And then when you reciprocate, one over that small error range becomes a very large error range. So if you were off even just a tiny bit in computing your remainder, you would start to magnify your errors and your continued fraction algorithm, while theoretically true, computationally might start to produce wrong numbers. For quadratic irrationals, however, our new algorithm is actually much better. So here was how we started computing our partial quotients. What's important is that xn plus 1 is done with minimal amount of division, and specifically you compute the hn and the jn as integers. So the jn's and hn's are integer valued, which means you don't have to be especially close to know exactly what they are. If you compute something and you know you're within, say, one half, and you computed 13.004, and it has to be an integer, well, then it has to be 13. So because we know the hn's and jn's must be integers, we don't need to be terribly precise in computing them in order to establish concretely what they are. We just have to be within a half. So the only real concern is computing xn plus 1. But 
we're going to see in a specific example that we don't really need the value of xn plus 1, we need its integer part, and that's actually subject to a lot less error than computing xn plus 1. Okay, so this technique, when you have a quadratic or rational number, is much faster and more accurate than the generic continued fraction algorithm, but it only works for quadratic irrationals. So let's go ahead and do the promised example. We're going to compute the continued fraction expansion of 3 plus root 7 over 2. Now I mentioned we don't need a lot of computational precision for this algorithm to work. Let's see why not. We're going to need to compute the integer part of x. That's going to be our first step, basically. So what's the integer part of x? And oh no, my calculator broke. Well, the square root of 7, I don't know what it is exactly. However, I know that 1 squared is less than 7 and 3 squared is bigger than 7. So the square root of 7 is in between 1 and 3. It's not a very good estimate, but it is a true estimate. So x, which has a 3 plus root 7 in the numerator, all over 2, is in between 4 over 2 and 6 over 2. Whatever x is, it is definitely in between 2 and 3. So its integer part is 2. And I didn't need to know very much about the square root of 7 to conclude that the integer part of x is exactly 2. So that's the sort of imprecise estimate that will give us exact values for partial quotients. Now before we start running our algorithm, we need to make sure that the number we have is in the desired form, that the denominator j is a factor of the number under the radical minus the number in the numerator not under the radical minus an arbitrary k times the denominator j all squared, etc. So in our example, j is 2, capital N is 7, h is 3, k is arbitrary. You expand all this out. Is 2 a factor of negative 4k squared plus 12k minus 2? Well, the value of k doesn't matter. It definitely is. So we don't need to multiply through by the denominator over the denominator. If you check this and j, your denominator, isn't a factor of that expression, simply multiply numerator and denominator either by plus denominator over plus denominator or minus denominator over minus denominator, depending on the sign of the radical up in the numerator, and you'll be fine. We don't need to do it here because it worked out. So we start running our algorithm. Our first uh, numerator number is 3. Our first denominator is 2. The number under the radical is 7, which will never change. x0 is x, and our first partial quotient we've already computed is 2. Now we start running through our recursive sequences until we get a pair of h and j which repeats. If we get an hj that repeats itself, well then, we've got an x sub n that has repeated itself, meaning our partial quotients are going to start repeating themselves. So we're just computing this, spitting out partial quotients as we go, until we notice an hj that is a repetition of a previous value, in which case we have found our repeated block. So here's what we've got so far. This top bar is our recursive formula, which we're just going to keep up there for reference. We've computed h0, j0 to be 3, 2, meaning x0 is 3 plus root 7 over 2. That's what the h and j were. And we've computed our first partial quotient, a0, to be 2. Now let's compute j1 is 7 minus 3 minus 2 times 2 squared over 2. Just looking back at our previous h, j, and a. This computes down to 3. h1 is a0 j0 minus h0, 2 times 2 minus 3, that's 1. So we found our new h and our new j. Is it the same as something we've seen before? 1 comma 3? Nope, not the same as 3 comma 2. So we need to compute our next partial quotient. So the next x is h over j with this plus root 7. How do we know what the integer part of this is? Well, we've got a 3 in the denominator, so we just need to ask what multiple of 3 are we in between up in the numerator? So the square root of 7 is in between 2 and 5. So that numerator is in between 3 and 6. So we're in between 1 and 2. The integer part, a sub 1, is exactly equal to 1. Okay, so we have computed in our previous step that h0, j0 is 3, 2, and a0 is 2, but more to the point, we just computed that h1, j1 is 1, 3, so x1 is 1 plus root 7 over 3, remember that's what the h's and j's are, and we computed the partial quotient a1 to be 1. Now we're going to refer to our recursive formulas to compute the next j is n minus the previous h minus the previous a times the previous j squared over the previous j, that computes to 1. The next h is previous a previous j minus previous h. That computes to 2. Have we seen the pair 2 comma 1 hj? Nope, we've seen 3 2 and 1 3, so 2 1 is different. We're going to have to keep going. So x2 is h plus root 7 over j, 2 plus root 7 over 1. We need to compute the integer part here. Well, the square root of 7 is in between 2 and 3. 
So x2 is in between 4 and 5, its integer part is exactly 4. So previously we, we computed h0, j0, and a0, h1, j1, and a1, and what we just computed was h2, j2 is 2, 1, meaning x2 is 2 plus root 7 over 1, and a2 is 4. So let's compute, again just referring to our recursive formulas up here, that the next j is n minus the previous h minus the previous a previous j squared over the previous j, that all computes to 3. Similarly, the next h is previous a, previous j minus previous h. That computes to 2. <clears throat> Have we seen the pair 2, 3, h, j? We haven't. We've seen 3, 2, but that's different than 2, 3. Which means we're going to have to keep going. So what's the partial quotient here? What's the integer part of 2 plus root 7 over 3? Since our denominator is 3, we're looking for multiples of 3 in the numerator. Well, root 7 is in between 1 and 4 which means x3 is in between 3 over 3 and 6 over 3, it's in between 1 and 2, so its integer part is exactly 1, and then we can keep going. What have we computed so far? We're up to h3, j3 was 2, 3, meaning x3 is 2 plus root 7 over 3. We just computed a partial quotient of 1, referring to the recursive formulas at top. j4 computes to be 2, h4 computes to be 1 x4 is 1 plus root 7 over 2. We do have to keep going because we have not seen the pair 1 comma 2 before. What's the integer part of 1 plus root 7 over 2? Well, root 7 is in between 1 and 3, so that's in between 2 over 2 and 4 over 2. It's in between 1 and 2. Its uh, integer part is exactly 1, and we keep going. So here's where we are. Referring to the recursive formulas up top, we need to compute j5, h5. j5 works out to be 3. h5 works out to be 1. Aha! We have seen the pair 1, 3. h1, j1 was 1, 3, and h5, j5 is 1, 3. So the indices 1 through 4 will now repeat themselves for indices 5 through 8, and then for indices 9 through 12, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we computed a0 is 2, a1 is 1, a2 is 4, a3 is 1, a4 is 1, and then we determined that the block of partial quotients from index 1 to 4 is what's going to repeat. So that's a block of 1, 4, 1, 1. So the continued fraction expansion of our original x, which was 3 plus root 7 over 2, is a 2, followed by the block 1, 4, 1, 1, which repeats. So what about algebraic numbers that aren't quadratic? So quadratic irrational numbers are particularly nice when it comes to their regular continued fraction expansion. Uh, they're irrational, so the expansion goes on forever, and it's eventually periodic. That exactly characterizes the quadratic irrationals. What about other algebraic numbers like cube roots, tenth roots, sums or differences or, or whatever of such things? Here we actually know very, very little. For example, we've shown that quadratic irrationals are exactly the numbers whose continued fraction expansion eventually repeats itself. It's not known whether there is any algebraic number of degree 3 or larger for which the sequence of partial quotients is bounded. So the number we just computed, uh, 3 plus root 7 over 2, its continued fraction expansion is 2, and then 1, 4, 1, 1, 1, 4, 1, 1, 1, 4, 1, 1. Observe, none of the partial quotients will ever be bigger than 4. It's easy to establish that if your continued fraction expansion is eventually periodic, there's an upper bound. Whatever that block is and whatever came before it, there's a largest partial quotient that appears. So any number that's quadratic irrational has a largest partial quotient. The partial quotients are bounded. It's possible, however, to have a number whose partial quotients are bounded that doesn't repeat itself. Um, I'm not going to get into details here, but it, it doesn't take too much work to come up with a sequence of numbers that does not repeat itself, but does not get too big. So we can have numbers whose continued fraction expansion doesn't repeat itself that are not quadratic irrationals. We do not know if any of those numbers could be algebraic. Okay, If you uh, have bounded partial quotients but don't repeat yourself, is it even possible to be an algebraic number? We just don't know. There is very little that is known about the regular continued fraction expansion of algebraic numbers of degree 3 or larger. It's kind of a big open problem to figure anything out about this.